Welcome everybody, welcome to the IK Plus webinar on efficacy in the flap dissection. Uh, today we'll talk about the deep flap surgery and uh, the aim is to be an inspiration and show direction for improving quality and efficacy in this type of surgery. Learning objectives are shared uh, beforehand and um, listed here. Um, and we have a great group of presenters. First of all, Ab Yukel from Manitoba and Venkat Ramakrishnan from uh, from the UK and Tim de Jong from Nijmegen, the Netherlands. And we are all uh, very much uh, happy about the topic and working with um, quite extensively in this on this topic. Uh, we're about 160 registrants actually, and we're from all over the world. So uh, you can see who you are on the global map. Um, I have the honor to start the webinar with a topic uh, that's very close to my heart, starting up a DF flap program as a junior. The perspective is that once you finish training and you start in your own hospital, uh, you want to set up a new uh, a program. Is it safe? Can you do it? And uh, what is involved in this? I have no disclosures. Um, and the perspective I said is uh, for trainees and junior microsurgeons and junior staff members. And I chose a very practical approach for this. Uh, microsurgery, first of all, is not a hobby, it's a specialty, it's a, it has a need for training, you need to do, but on the hand, other hand, you need to do more to get better. Uh, autonomous flap, um, I think there's a, a flap for almost every woman. Uh, small breasted women have uh, flat abdomens, so it usually, uh, it, it's well, <laughs> very nice to, uh, to connect the the abdomen to the breast, if you will, with the flap. Or if the abdomen is unsuitable, there's usually a, another option that's existing for autologous reconstruction. So the flaps, especially, they are very popular, they're versatile, the demand is rising and it's a lasting result. Uh, in addition, it, it is a bulk is maybe not the right word, but you do, you can do them in quite a volume that you can get really familiar and this, uh, provides opportunity to uniform and standardize the procedure, but also to measure outcomes. So there are many opportunities, and uh, to my mind, these procedures are really rewarding for patient and surgeon, and also they can be fun. And uh, so when you finish micro training, like I, I did, my purpose is to do microsurgery as a plastic surgeon that really makes me happy, and I wanted to start in my hospital, but Nobody knows about microsurgery, so you need to convince people, you need to get organized, you need to get known to get the older referrals. And also, you need to convince the people that refer people to you that you're okay doing this. On the other hand, the young surgeon is ambitious, is keen, uh, you're keen to start, but you want to be safe, you want to show the quality, you need to improve care, so you're, you're all motivators to, to start such a program. The responses from the hospital floor, especially when you're a young surgeon and starting up such a system, is they can be quite skeptical. They can say there's no time, it's too expensive, let's order the leeches because they always go blue and you order an ICU bed, the procedure will last 24 hours or you know, you're a cowboy, it's unsafe. Uh, it will be all sorts of arguments against setting up a new uh, line in autologous reconstructions. So that brings us down to the requirements for change and innovation. I think you always need to show that you're additional, you're providing additional value over existing options. You need to show predictable outcomes. You need to show you're safe and you need to show that you're, again, being being additional. You, you're bringing something extra into the, into the system. In order to do this, actually the most efficient and, and reliable way to my mind is to start measuring you need to work on a constant quality improvement program. That means you measure what you do, you measure how you do it, you measure your time, you measure trouble and complications. And these things you review and adjust, which is really the, the lean startup method. And I can really highly re recommend the, the book from Eric Reese. It's, it's uh, as an audio book, but you can also get paper copies. One of the examples I use quite frequently is I set up a, a Google uh, form and I put it on the desktop of my phone. Uh, and this way I can, after a procedure, I can just, it takes me a minute, just uh, type in a couple of details, 
about the free flaps or that's that's my passion micro so i want to keep track of how how much i do and why this gives you instant uh, results for presentations such as this this is my practice i do these flaps and so it's um it's really quick and reliable way and it's a lot quicker than going through admin data and being res relying on others to provide you to tell you what you're actually doing from this sort of basic principle, we started looking at setting up our DFLAP program right after training. Is it really safe? And the aim was to measure and compare and also improve, of course. The hospital where I started from scratch was a small location of a 750 bed a regional hospital, and there was no me previous microsurgical routine there. So we asked the question, is it safe? Um, uh, these type of procedures are generally generally under the scope of a lot of online platforms and, and, and uh, social media. So it's, it's really good to be aware of this. And it's good to compare your own results to your peers and to your superiors, if you will, the, the center that you came from, to convince that you can do this, that you're not underperforming, that people can come to you and you can tell them you're in good hands because we looked at this. From this, the aim was to compare the results of three trainees. Uh, my my peers, we uh, we us three finished training in Rotterdam at the same in the same year, um, and we were all micro oriented. We all set up a DFLAP program in the hospital where we started after graduating from micro from plastic surgery training. Uh, the, we compared a small or large in the university hospital to the center of excellence, which was the hospital where we were trained in Rotterdam. And we compared the first first 40 flaps of us, the three of us with 152 from the Erasmus MC. So this is us, um, this is Thijs de Wit from the MVA in uh, Breda, uh, Peter van Dijn from the Leiden University Medical Center, and us three had 152 flaps and we compared them to the Erasmus Medical Center of Mark Moreau, our, our trainer. We looked at revisional surgeon compromised flaps and flap loss as primary outcomes. Uh, difference were that typically uh, most of us had, had the procedures done by a team of two surgeons, whereas in our training center, uh, usually it was done by one surgeon and a trainee. When you look at the outcome, this is a way, it's really nice of plotting each bar, represent the patient and, and the y-axis, the number of minutes the procedure takes. And uh, in red, there's a flap loss, in blue is a successful uh, flap, in, in purple there's a partial flap loss, and in green there's a successful revision. When you look and compare all these uh, plots, we, we and we did all the we did all the statistics. We got to the conclusion that yes, we can perform these flaps, and yes, we are safe in doing this. Um, moreover, if you compare the first ten to the last ten. Uh, unilateral DF flaps and you look at surgical time, you can see a steep decrease of up to 30% of time in, in surgical time. So this is important data to share with your board and, and your colleagues. When, when you start doing DF flaps, it might take a long time, but you can tell them, we'll get better at this, we'll get quicker at it, so it will be more making more sense um, towards the future you'll see that you'll make less complications um, uh, as time evolves. And you'll have a steep reduction in surgical time if you're focusing on efficacy, for instance. And you'll show it's safe to start such a program, so it will help you in convincing. So I hope you can uh, have some uh, input from this. We, of course, kept on doing this. As you can see, these are the first um, uh, I think almost 100 DF flaps, unilateral cases only. When you compare those, flap loss is, is quite acceptable under the 2% mark. And you can see surgical time is moving from 400 average to uh, 180 minutes right here. So it's and 180 minutes will take you less effort and will uh, a lot will, will feel uh, quite relaxing if you compare it to the longer procedures. So and in addition, you'll see that you'll make less complications. It will get better for both you, but more, most importantly for the patient. And we've got all these data, we'll be publishing it soon. 
You can also look at unilateral by two surgeons, whereas you can also go unilateral with one surgeon. And the one surgeon, again, you can see that your decline in surgical time is, is quicker in our case. So slow starts leads to a great improvement with the right mindset. Now I've got some practical uh, practicalities to share with you in, uh, with regards to DF flaps. Um, of course, there's uh, um, the, the biggest stories are by the other presenters, but first of all, quality is the purpose and speed follows quality. And that's just the way in the right order about these things. Secondly, operating should be fun. You, you should be able to relax because the DF flap, it is a, uh, you can do quite a few of them. And uh, when you feel stressed, it says something, it should tell you something. It should be something to, um, for yourself to uh, uh, come up with a solution to relax more. I can highly recommend the, this audio book, The Toyota Way. And one of the principles that the Toyota company um, became an excellent example of uh, both incorporating quality um, and through quality uh, getting better at outcomes is by reducing waste. And waste means not garbage, but it means wasted energy, wasted time. So you get more functional, you get better and your quality rates go up. To start with preoperative preparation. I think preoperative planning is really important, especially when you start in a DF program. Uh, CT scans will be quite helpful. You need to optimize these scans. You need to talk to your radiologist for optimal timing of contrast if they are not familiar with it. And use this scan to select your perforator, your first and your second choice uh, preoperatively and in, envision with the scan the intramuscular root of the perforator. It helps you to prepare in your mind for the procedure and it will help you reduce surprises. In the theater, I think leaders show the way. You should be present, you should be helpful, you should be encouraging team spirit. You know, you help it with whatever needs to be done. Um, bringing a catheter lineup, uh, bringing uh, a bed in and out of theater. Uh, call the anesthetist, be positive, be complimenting. People make jokes and, and also get coffee for the others. It's, it's just a simple thing, but it really uh, pushes the team spirit into the team. Of course, best is to uh, assign uh, each team member with a specific, specific task, but that's only if you're with a fixed uh, team that will be, that, that's the best way, I suppose. Preemptively, the first cases I really Doppler, I don't Doppler anymore. Uh, and then with lining up the, the patient, it's really important to optimize anesthesia. Talk to your anesthetist, uh, I'm, I'm using local anesthetics a lot so they can really cut down their, their morphines and the patient is awake quicker. That's, that's in our case, uh, our experience. And then when you look at surgery, um, the DF flap is 90% uh, easy. So it really comes down to choosing for yourself. Are you, are you gonna do all the simple things at once or are you gonna spread the load and, and address the 10% of complex stuff uh, all throughout the surgery. It's, it's like eating a plate. Um, some people finish with the best last and some people mix everything, but just think about who you are in this question. As I mentioned, complex surgery is only 10%. I like it uh, clustered, all the complex stuff. So I like to start with all the easiest stuff. And then I can really narrow down my, my line of attention to the 10% that needs my, uh, it, that, that is a bit more complex. I think algorithms prevent thinking during the surgery. I think less thinking means less stress during surgery and less stress is better and it gives you a, a more relaxing experience. In other words, algorithms increase success. So examples of algorithms is there's what, usually makes the DF flap complex for people is all the choices you have to make. And um, um, it's, it's really good to sort of categorize the, the choices that you have on your way. One of them is, when do I clip a branch? Uh, you're always afraid to clip the, the main pedicle. So a simple algorithm is always count to three. 
if you have the, the perforator and there's a branch, the perforator is sort of moving in another direction, before you can clip the side branch, you need to so see the third branch, which is the main pedicle. It's a very simple thing. When you come from the perforator, you follow it, you can usually see the main pedicle in one stage, but you can only start deciding which one to clip if you have the third one inside. Try it. I'm sure you'll like it. The rest, the simple bit is usually about 10 to 20 minutes. I use local with adrenaline. I do a full pocket dissection. I'm reducing sutures for the pocket and the, the IMF. I place a drain and I prepare for the IMA dissection with the standard setup and minimum amount of instruments. The complex part of the uh, breast is usually five to 10 minutes. Usually radiation is not an issue. Sometimes you have vulnerable arteries. Uh, I use bipolar for intercoastal, uh, intercoastal deep layer and I use monopolar until I reach that, that deep layer. Um, I use the perforator of the M MIA, IMA to predict uh, how medial the IMA is. And I know my escape. So the vein is small, I go cranial. I remove usually the lymph nodes because they're in the way and I send them off for pathology. Um, and if, if it's really bad, you can always go to the contralateral IMA by a subcutaneous tunnel. It's really helpful to standardize this. Your setup is for exposure. Uh, you, you really want exposure. The aim is for minimal assistance, uh, so you use a minimum number of instruments. I like to work only with maybe three or four instruments all the way, and the rest uh, I, I usually don't use. I typically go between the ribs, I make a U-shaped flap. The U-shaped is really important because you go right over the upper surface of the, of, the, of the rib, but you have to bring it up to get the full exposure. And I'll show you in this video. First you palpate which intercoastal space is the widest. I don't count them really anymore. Usually it's between three and four and two and three. You split the pectoralis major and set up a, a separate uh, uh, spreader. Here's a U-shaped uh, 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 O-hook with a uh, weight attached to it. Now we are in the intercoastal space and I use a monopolar to make a U-shaped flap. And you can see clearly all the fibers of the intercoastal muscle. After this is finished, uh, and you need to be fully medial is really important because if you're lateral, you get pneumothoraxes. And um, now we start looking for the, for the little fat pad, for the mediastinal fat. And then I switch to monopolar to dissect it off. I'm covering the, the fat pad. Once you have the fat pad done, the artery and vein are right there. And you just need a little dissecting clamp to Take them out. If you're in the right perivascular space, this will take you maybe five minutes. This tends to bleed, so I usually uh, uh, use bipolar a lot. So now you put the spreader where the U-shaped flap is now moved cranially, and this is the dissecting clamp. As you can see, it takes me, uh, it takes usually a, a couple of minutes to do this. So that's basically it. So the, the distance is right when you can put your uh, coupler device in between the ribs. So usually one finger for me is, is just enough length for the intermammary artery. The abdomen, the easy part of the abdomen is the abdominoplasty. Again, use your wide planes. I, I use a standard abdominoplasty approach. I, I first do the cranial uh, incision. I leave the nerves and the peripherals, peripherals as much as possible, moving cranial to prevent seroma. Uh, I use a narrow tunnel. First the cranial incision, then I test uh, the abdominal flap if I can reach the caudally plant incision. Um, and then I'll undermine the flap laterally to medially and caudally to cranially until I've uh, probably left a, a three by three centimeter uh, part of the flap very umbilic umbilically. Um, uh, so I only have a uh, a small uh, leftover bit to dissect. Um, the epigastric, uh, superior epigastric vein, I usually clip them and it's, um, 
Usually this takes about, again, uh, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes. So this is the testing of the caudal incision. Caudal incision. This is right after uh, undermining also the flap. And this is just before you step into your zone of focusing and, and go towards your perforator area. So this is all loose and really helps you for exposure also during your dissection. But a perforator dissection usually takes uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. It's really important that this is a mindset you encounter that when you do a unilateral uh, flap, there's always the contralateral as an escape. So it's like playing tennis. You do the first serve. The first serve is really to see what you can do. Um, of course, you're always focusing on safe, but you'll, it's, it's also a mindset where you, where you can relax because you have the other side. So be cautious, but do work to, to do it efficiently. As I said, I choose the, the perforator before the surgery starts. I follow the CT. So uh, usually if you go for a medial perforator, you'll find a lateral one and don't hesitate. If you go for the medial, just cut the lateral one and move uh, medially. So know your preferences beforehand. You go for a medial or lateral, you do, you do one perforator or two perforator. Just think of your own personal algorithm in this way as well. And when you encounter these perforators, you go around the perforator on a superficial level, like, like here. So you encounter it, don't stop there, go beside, beside, and also through the back. And then you can start thinking about getting the perforator out of the fascia. So arteries go to, through sliding holes in the fascia. So I like to make a very clean dissection of the perforator so the vein can expand and it's not being limited by the circumferential uh, fascia of the rectus. Uh, I do a fasciotomy, and then I move cranially first, and then I go caudal. And I, I, I cut the septum, the, the, the fascia, all the way the, the, to the full length I, will, I intend to use it. Then I do a subfascial isolation of the perforator, and then I cut the fascia surrounding, surrounding the, the perforator, and then I dissect it out of the muscle. It's a small video showing what I usually do. I said, uh, you encounter this perforator and then you go besides. And also you continue going until you're deep to the perforator. So it's really loose circumferentially uh, on top of the fascia. Then I usually get a dissecting clamp. I go into this sliding hole, which is the, the, where the perforator runs through the fascia. Then I move cranially away from the main pedicle. Why? Because it gives you a lot of more, more vision about where is your perforator located caudally. So then I can use my scissors. First I look at where it is and then I cut through the fascia and I move it all the way down uh, to the length of the pedicle that I in intend to use. Usually a lot of people stop halfway uh, but you, you'll notice that when, if you finish it, you'll, you'll finish it. Again, now the deep uh, to the uh, fascia dissection, again, moving it all the way through to the back of the, to, to the other side of the perforator. Again, with the clamp going circumferentially. And now you know that the superficial layer is loose and the subfascial layer is loose. You could just get a pair of scissors to cut it loose because uh, there's nothing surrounding it that you can injure. If it starts bleeding, you know the margin is wide enough so you could just use a bipolar to, to stop the bleeding. And from this, you can then dissect it out of the muscle. Important is that once you move caudally, take off the flap cranially as well, because you'll see that you can flip it around and you see so you can have clearer visibility of your pedicle. Only leave when the plane flies. So once your flap is uh, dissected, leave it at its pedicle to show color. Uh, especially in the beginning, you need to know your product before you move it. So I would typically take about five to 10 minutes of time to, to let the, the flap show what it's worth. Once you do more of these cases, this gets, this gets less important, but especially in the beginning, it's really helpful. Time saving during this phase is, 
making use of this time. Mark the perforator of the skin with a staple, reduce the flap at the abdomen, usually you only need a small part of the abdomen to move to the breast, and deepithelialize what you can deepithelialize already. It's better to deepithelialize it at the abdomen over deepithelializing after anastomosis is done. I prefer to leave a perforator in the skin island so the nurses can monitor uh, flap viability. So at the abdomen here, you can see uh, deep thelialization going, and it's already partially closed, preparing for a full closure once microsurgery is done. Only leave after checking the landing strip. This means that um, you, you can only uh, clip your flap, the pedicle, if you know your chest is in order. This is my typically, typical setup. I do a wet gauze over the sternum. Why over here? Because if you have it, the flap here, it will block your hands. This way you have both your hands free to do your microsurgery. I have an O hook that's being pulled laterally by a, a kilo weight that's uh, attached to it. I have a spreader spreading the, the pectoralis and the U-shaped flap cranially. And I have a, a suction drain. Now the suction is really important. Usually fluids go to the lowest point. So you place the tip of your suction at its lowest point. And I use a, a small loop with three uh, staples and then the, the suction is going through the spreader clamp and placed in the, uh, the deepest point. Position your microscope properly, horizontally. You should both be sitting comfortably and making sure you're uh, sitting correctly. What really helps is to know your ocular distance so your microscope is set up to properly. For micro, it's really important to, to standardize techniques. I know when this little thread goes down, I have really big trouble, um, trouble uh, uh, tying the knot. I know, on the other hand, if, if this little thread goes from my forceps in towards the, the direction of the microscope, I'll always be right at making these uh, nuts, as you can see here. These are simple uh, steps that you can take to standardize your, your throwing of your sutures. Um, after the osmosis, it's really important to feel the pulsations uh, in the pedicle before you clip it. And then you can feel the pulsations again after anastomosis. So if you feel the pulsations in the same way, you know it's going to be good. Watch for bleeding, of course, and also watch for pulsations in the perforator. So when you know what your flap is like at the abdomen, you should see the same thing in the chest. Memory artery is really powerful, so you, you should be seeing the similar things. So is it okay? I think this is a major time saver. Um, usually it takes a lot of time if you're, um, if you're sort of in doubt. So the more flaps you do, the more you, you notice that if one team member is sort of in doubt, it's not okay. Always decide against yourself. Always decide to redo your anastomosis, even though you feel tired. It will not be all right. So redo the anastomosis, keep calm. Or when you, when you are tired, which can be the case, just go for coffee in between and have a break. You'll feel better and be more successful when you come back after coffee. Because fat and skin, they can take ischemia, and these are the components of your flap. After each uh, procedure, it's really important in the constant uh, improvement cycle that you're in, be critical, check for lost time, check for stress that was uncalled for, and aim for less instruments and movements. Aim for fun and relaxation. I think that's really important moving forward. Um, when you start doing these cases, I would go for unilateral, small breasts of women, which are, have a BMI of less than 30. You can pre-expand with a tissue expander. It, it will take you about an hour less to, to shape the flap. No smokers, no radiation. And those are the really easiest cases. I think make, micro brings uh, grateful patients. Uh, often you see you can use one free flap to fix years of problems. It, it shows great learning curves, uh, measurable outcomes, so it's fun to see your progress. 
and you should be measuring to compare it's a lot of fun so i really recommend you doing that so that was it thank you for your attention